you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity to share your word and to edify those who are believers in Christ. If there's anything vying for our attention for the next half hour or so, I pray that we would be disciplined enough to lay those aside so that we can focus on the Christmas message tonight. We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, let's look at the uh, monitor here. I'm just going to take us through. And I know it looks like you have a nice schedule. looks like a, a lot of good things are going to happen the rest of the evening. So I'll try not to take too long. I won't go over two hours. And so Christmas is a time when we celebrate the birth of Christ, the birth of Jesus, who is Emmanuel, meaning God with us or God is with us. This powerful message reminds us that we are never alone. Think about that for a moment, okay? God is with us. That's what the essence of Christmas is all about. God with us. So we're never, ever alone. Even though we may feel like it at times. We may feel like, oh, I'm by myself. No one understands my trials, my turmoil. I just feel all alone. That's not true. His name alone shouts, He's with us. In fact, his birth stands as empirical evidence that he is with us, God with us. It started 2,000 years ago through Jesus Christ, the birth in the manger, the birth in the feeding trough. And so we have this wonderful reminder every time we assemble together on the December 25 with friends, family, and loved ones, we just, we share gifts, right? We enjoy each other. We can't wait to tear open the wrapper and say, ah, oh, what did I get this year? But please remember that the best gift that has ever, ever been given before, it took place 2,000 years ago. And a lot of people now do not understand that. They think that, you know, December 25 is just a holiday. It's happy holidays. It's not Merry Christmas. But the truth of Christmas started with a baby. That baby is known as Jesus Christ, who lived a full life, 33 and a half years. And at the end of those 33 and a half years, he ultimately went on the cross to pay the sin debt of the world. And that is truly the best gift in all of history, because it, it evolves around a person, not... Uh, not a gift wrapper or a Christmas tree, but a person. So in front of you, it's a powerful message. Why is it powerful? Because it evolves around a person. And that person has been given to you and to me. And I've been advocating for a while now to advance the cause of Christ. And those of you who know me, I've been trying to get people to advance the cause of Christ because that's truly the reason why he came here. That's truly the reason why we have Christmas so that we can be reconciled, the world can be reconciled to God. That's the whole reason why we're here. We still have life because of Him. And every time we live, every day that we live, we should be grateful for that and express that gratitude by service unto God. In every way, shape, form, we should always be thinking, what can I do for Him? It's all about him. He's the celebrity. It's not some singer or some rock star. He's the rock star. So it's during our joys and sorrows, triumphs and struggles, God is present. He's with us, offering guidance, comfort, and love. He offers that through the eternal writings of God's word, the um, scripture. The Greek word... Here is God with us. It's the word Emmanuel, which means God with us. I comment on that just in the first paragraph here, the opening. Emmanuel, God with us. Imagine a world, think for a moment, a world where everyone recognizes the significance of Emmanuel. In other words, think of a time where the world, if that's possible, would know and recognize Emmanuel for self. It would be a world where kindness and compassion would flow freely. It wouldn't be forced. It wouldn't be fake. It wouldn't be plastic. It would be a world where kindness and compassion was just evident wherever you go. Understanding and acceptance replaced division and conflict. Don't we see a lot of division and conflict today? That's because it's the absence of Emmanuel. When there's no Emmanuel, you'll have conflict, divisions, fights. 
because there's no Emmanuel. They don't understand that there's a person greater than them to, that can help them navigate through life and to pacify the ongoing anger that might be inside them for whatever reason, upbringing, lack of job, lack of love, whatever it is that is struggling and causing turmoil in the heart of man, God's purpose is to reconcile the, per the world to himself and then spoil that son or daughter with much love, with much gifts that comes ultimately from God, the Emmanuel. But when the world doesn't have Emmanuel, they don't have any, they won't have any resolution. There won't be any harmony or rapport with each other. Everyone would be an enemy to them. You go down the typical street today, if any young person is looking to an, at a, another young person, there's a brawl that's about to break out. If two men are looking at each other, they're like, okay, who are you looking at? And there's a standoff. And I, it happens to me going to church. If two guys are looking at each other, they look at each other up and down, just they stare at each other, yeah, go ahead, keep looking, I dare you. And then the hands get up, they, it's almost like they're going to fight. Why? There's anger and frustration inside building. And they don't even know it except when the first punch is thrown. I see this all the time, ladies and gentlemen. This is my job. This is my forte. And so I can look at a person and size them up. Yes, I can size them up. I could read them. I have a way with discerning what's going on in the life of that individual by just spending a few minutes asking them questions, steering the conversation. I can tell where they're going. I can tell what their life is like in a sense, in a general sense, because there is something that's usually missing and a few words, a few words, a few questions and I can tell they're not happy or they're bored, bored with life. A lot of people are bored and so what do they do? They get involved with things so that they won't be bored anymore. Where does that boredom come from? A lack of relationship with God. And I know people are going to say, well, oh my God, you're just saying that because you're the pastor. Of course I'm going to say that because I'm the pastor, but I'm also going to say that because that is the truth. If I'm not telling the truth, why are people bored? People can never, never answer that question to me. So what do they do? They default into doing things that will replace the boredom. And usually, usually, that provokes and causes more problems. They go down this rabbit trail and they're in a big mess and they don't even know how they got there. They're like, how did I get here? That's my job. As a pastor, I've been around, I've seen the things, I've assessed people's lives, I've helped people anywhere from juvenile hall, 5051, you name it, I've been there, I've been there for individuals who've been in trouble and I have talked to all sorts of people and you're saying, well, I thought you were giving me a Christmas message. I am. I'm just saying that this is part of the reason why we should celebrate Christmas because you all there, listening online, listening to this message, there in person at our Church of Hope gathering, you should be thoroughly pleased with the fact that you have rapport with the sovereign supreme God who loves you. And there are people that you do not, that do not know this and you know them. And you should be getting the word out to them. Because my question would be, what kind of friend are you if you have not told them? And if you say, well, I'm, I'm a little shy, that's, that's not really a strong enough argument, especially when eternity is in the balance. So my question again on the bottom, imagine a world where everyone recognizes the significance of Emmanuel. It would replace this division and conflict. Emmanuel shows us that God, listen to this, in his infinite wisdom, only God has infinite wisdom, and infinite grace chose to be with us, bridging the gap between heaven and earth. He came down from up here to be down here with us. That's Emmanuel. The Christmas, this Christmas message will use the first letter of each message, each person of the Godhead, F-S-H. So I'm taking the first letter of each Godhead uh, to highlight the significance of Christmas for believers along with visual illustrations. Okay, so here we go. 
We're going to start with the Father. The Father's love, Christmas reminds us that the immense love of the Father who sent the Son into the world to save us. The visual I want you to think of, here it is, picture a heart symbolizing the Father's love radiating from a loving Father's hands. So you can think of the Father like this. His heart's there in the center. He sent His Son and His Son, His only begotten Son, to us for the world so that we might have everlasting life. So you see this uh, God's love, you see this heart in the middle coming from the Father's hand. So that's a visual imagery of the Father. So we that's F for Father. We still have eight, S and H. So for S, we have the Son Sacrifice. Christmas celebrates the Son Sacrificial Act, leaving His heavenly throne to be born as a human, ultimately sacrificing His life for our redemption. So the visual here is depict the cross or picture a cross or see the cross here in the imagery representing Jesus' sacrifice with a shining star above it. Okay, So that displays. And on the bottom there, I found this image. There's a manger that's supposed to be a manger with uh, Mary and Joseph. And so he's there in the manger. And the cross, I want you to think about this. The cross was where he was headed. He was born to, to die. That was his goal. To come to this world, to be born, and to die. He had 33 years left to eventually go to the cross to pay the sin debt for us. But the first birthday or the first Christmas is right there in the manger. That's just a visual. Okay. So 2,000 years ago, he was born. And that was the very first Christmas. And that was the starting point, point to go to the cross to ultimately secure salvation for the world. But people will not be saved until they believe in Jesus Christ. So for, just as a reminder, just in case anybody is listening here, you're in there in person for the first time, the message is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So if you're there for the first time or you're listening to this message on our channel on YouTube or on the website, If you've never believed in Jesus Christ, you can secure that right now. I'm not asking you to believe that he's real. I'm not asking if he's a man or God. You just take his promise to heart. For God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son that if you would believe, you would not perish, but you would have everlasting life. It's as simple as that. You just believe in Jesus, take him at his promise, and if you do, everlasting life. So depicting a cross, it represents his ultimate sacrifice on the cross with a shining star above it. Lastly, we have the Holy Spirit. H for Holy Spirit. What was the first letter? F for Father. S for Son. H for the Holy Spirit. So I'm incorporating the first initials of the triune Godhead. F-S-H. For H, we have the Holy Spirit's hope. Through Christmas, we receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit, who brings us hope, comfort, and guidance in our lives. So the visual here, most people are familiar with a picture of a dove of some of some sort, especially when you know the story when Jesus was baptized and his father said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then a picture of a dove uh, descends and comes upon the Son of God. And so that imagery in most denominations is an imagery of a, whole, of a dove. And so I found this online as well. And so that was the only one that I could find that kind of reflects the, the impact and the, what I'm trying to convey in this point here with Holy Spirit. So through Christmas, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He's also known as the third person of the Trinity or our comforter, also our helper. Jesus needed to go so that he can send us a helper. And so that's God, the Holy Spirit. So it's a dove symbolizing the Holy Spirit descending with rays of light, bringing hope to a person's heart. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. It's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all coming together to celebrate the birth of Christ. If it were not for the Father's love, if it were not for the Son's 
obedience. If it were not for the Holy Spirit, we ha would have no reason to celebrate. So the essence and the true meaning of Christmas starts with one word, Emmanuel. Because God is with us, you and I have hope. Some of you have gone through hell and back. Some of you have gone through hardship. And you're still going through it. But you know what? God is going to see you through. He's going to take care of you because He's your Father. You're His son. You're His daughter. You hang in there and just give Him time. And He's working out the logistics. He's working all things out together for good to those who love Him. And as you know, you love Him by obeying Him. If you love me, John 14:15. Obey me. And when you obey him, he orchestrates things to work together for good to those who love God. So that's the Holy Spirit. A few more things and then I think that's it. Might have a few things at the end. So let us embrace the spirit of Christmas and beyond the Emmanuel in mind. Let us be aware of the message and enjoy each other. Your company there next to you on the same table across from you to your left to your right enjoy each other treasuring the uniqueness and beauty of everyone everyone is different everyone has different personalities and so take advantage of that enjoy the friendship enjoy the brother the fellowship the koinonia of the brother and sister in Christ and nurture that we're family right may we be inspired to extend a helping hand to those in need to offer words of encouragement to those feeling lost. To share the love of God with everyone we meet. I mean, isn't that what it means to, partially mean to be a Christian? To be Christ-like? And that's what he did. He made an impact wherever he went. And if you're not making an impact, you're not following the life of Christ. And so we're supposed to be people that make impact wherever we go. That's part of what it's like to be a, a believer in Christ. To be a Christ follower. So offer words of encouragement to those who are feeling lost. Offer a pat on the back, a hug, a half hug, whatever it takes. Hey, you know what? I haven't seen you in a while. And how have you been? Extend grace like that. Because if Jesus was here literally, I believe he would be doing the same thing. Trying to rally people up so that they can make the rapture exit out of here. Because I think the rapture is just around the corner, folks. I think before you know it, we're going to be out of here and then we're going to be gone forever, ever, ever, ever. And that's a good thing because we're going to be with the Lord. Now you may be thinking like, well, what's, am I going to play a violin on the clouds? It's going to be far greater than that, I assure you. Some people say, I think some people don't care to do anything because they're like, well, if I go to heaven, I'm just going to be playing a violin on the cloud, right? No, that's only in Hollywood. That's only in comics. That's only in cartoons. You're going to be face to face with the living God. And then you're going to realize that people don't make it. Not everyone's going to make it. That's the time you're going to say, you know what, I should have took this stuff more seriously. I should have been ratcheting down on the Bible, learning more about this because now I'm now going to spend eternity with the person that we've been studying about in church or in our Bible classes. Now I'm going to spend eternity with him. And those who are not going to spend eternity are going to hear, look, you didn't want to know about me while you were down there. Why would I take you up here? Because that would be, you'd be miserable. You didn't even want, you didn't even want to know about me while you were down there on earth. Why should I bring you up here when you didn't want to know me down there? So that's the reason why you're not going to make it up here. Now I'm talking about those who reject God. Because he's not going to allow people to enter into his kingdom who do not first pass through his son, Jesus Christ. It was Jesus himself who said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So when the Father states that and says that as an imperative or Jesus, he's not going to bypass his son. That's not. He's not going to override what was recorded in Holy Writ. You must comply with what was recorded in Scripture. And when a person is going to go before the throne of grace and be judged, God's going to say, let's see what he did while he was alive. The books are going to be open and he's going to say, well, this guy did two million good deeds. Okay. Jesus, come here. 
here's a guy with two million good deeds and here's my son plus R. Plus R is plus righteousness. And then the two million, two million good deeds, he has minus R. He does not have the righteousness of Christ. That could have been imputed to him. Imputed to him at the moment of faith. So when you believe in Jesus Christ, the righteousness that envelops Jesus is now transferred to your account. So that when the Father looks down at you, he sees sheer perfection, not your own righteousness, but the righteousness that came from Christ when you first believed in him. But if you don't believe in him, you're standing on your own righteousness, your own millions and millions of good deeds, which still amounts to minus R. So you fall short no matter how many good deeds you do. And it still registers as minus R. Minus R, minus R, minus R. How about this guy? Minus R, minus R, minus R. What about her? Minus R, minus R, minus R. Every person who is being judged for heaven or hell is based on their righteousness to see if all their good deeds can come close to the righteousness that comes from Christ. And they're going to find out, no, 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 no. Not him, not her, not them, not they. All of them are minus R. And the only way you can pass into heaven is through the plus R. That plus R or plus right? <clears throat> plus R, which means righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the Emmanuel that we've been talking about, that Christmas gift that came 2,000 years ago, that Emmanuel that could have been his, her, them, theirs, they rejected it because they were too busy focusing on de the details of life, focusing on fun, focusing on everything else except their eternity. Their eternity. Well, look, not everyone thinks about the, their eternal state, right? Let's be real, okay? I'll be real with you. I'm, I'm human just like you. I have challenges just like all of you. The truth is, not everyone worries about eternal, eternal things. They want to wait to the very end and then they say, well, when I'm 80, when I'm 90, when I'm 100, then I'll start thinking about being good. Then I'll start thinking about believing in God. First of all, you don't know if you're going to make it to, to 90 or 100. That's the first problem. Second of all, what if you have cancer later, uh, later in life or you get hit with COVID and you don't make it? Let's just say, do we know people like that? Yes. You think they were thinking they were going to die during the pandemic? I don't think so. I think they were caught by surprise. And so now, if they, if they did not acquiesce to Jesus prior to their last breath, it's too late. Why would you wait? Why would you just flip a coin and say, well, I'll just wait later because I'm too busy with this, that, and the other. If you're too busy for this and the other, with this and the other, then you're too busy, my friend. You're way too busy. If you're too busy to consult and prioritize God, you're way too busy. Nothing should come before your relationship with God. Not family, not money, not house, nada. I've said this and I've lived this principle for, for all I know. God first before anything else. You, 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 um, you change the order of your priorities to put God second or third, that's, that's dangerous. So this is why Christmas always starts with the, a reality check. So you're here learning about the Emmanuel. You're here, you've learned about the FSH. All of that is good news. And I, I want to end on a, close on a good new, note. But you know, sometimes when we have people together like this, this is the ideal time to share about the importance of acquiescing to Jesus Christ and not waiting any longer. Now, if you've already waited, if you've already believed in Jesus Christ, excellent. Merry Christmas to you. You now know the essence of Christmas. And my question to you now is, what are you doing about it? I mean, now that you understand that Christmas is about a person, what are you doing to display the ultimate gift? The gift, uppercase T, gift. The gift that's about a person. It's not supposed to be celebrated once a year and 
just in the mean in in the means of, by means of just exchanging gifts. You're supposed to reflect and remember that the gift has been given to you. Now your soul is never destined for the lake of fire. Let that sink in. You are never, ever, ever going to have that problem at all because you've acquiesced to the gift that God has graciously bestowed and made available to you without any pressure of any kind. And so now you have life. You have the vaccine for sin. You've taken it. Now, our job is to continue to advance this to other people. Every time we celebrate Easter or Resurrection, every time we celebrate um, Christmas, it should always have a point somewhere in all of this to redirect our attention to the reality of why God allowed this to happen in the first place. Why did He allow His Son to die during Easter or Resurrection? Why did He allow His Son to be born? We have to take those things into consideration and rethink and reassess why we even come together. Is it just for fellowship? Is it, is it just for fun? It's much more than that, ladies and gentlemen. Far more than that. It's about a person who forfeited himself so that we might have life. Okay? So now, when we understand the true meaning of Emmanuel, it, trans, it transforms our perspective. It really should. We should look at life completely differently. You'll hear me say divine viewpoint. It's our perspective now, looking at life through the lens of Scripture. We find strength in knowing that we are never alone in our journey through life. We may feel like we're alone, but we're never not. The only reason why we may feel alone is when there's a disconnect. When We know where God can be found, but it's are we willing to go to Him through His Word. That's the real big issue. Most of us are not making the time to get into God's Word to find Him. So we're never alone. The only reason why we feel alone is when we're disconnected to His Word. But His Word is always there. It's always available. And He never leaves us. If we're far apart from each other, the only person that leaves is you or me. Not Him. God is always there. Now, as far as a believer is concerned, it is true that He lives in us. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit indwells the believer. That's true. He never leaves us. But I'm talking about a fellowship kind of relationship where if we feel distant, there's a disconnect. And so if there's a disconnect, we're far away from the Word and the fellowship is not sensed anymore because we're not in His Word. We're supposed to abide in His Word. And when we do, the truth will set us free and we're going to be on charge. We're going to be recharged like a, an energy battery, uh, energizer battery. And we're going to feel like, oh, I can tackle the world. And so as you are steeped in His Word, you sense that. You sense that. So we can find consolation in the knowledge that God walks beside us and He's in us, providing comfort and guidance even in the most challenging of times. And that is true. This Christmas, as we exchange gifts, I know we are, and gather with loved ones, we may also remember the greatest gift of all. Not a gift, but the gift. Emmanuel. The presence of God in our lives. Let us bask in the warmth of His love, and may that love radiate outward, bringing hope, peace, and joy to all who need it. A lot of people need it today, folks. You look in people's eyes and you can see there's an emptiness, there's a void, and people are scrambling in the store. They just want to take, 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 break into the stores and steal, steal, steal. Why? Because there's a void. There's an anger. There's a frustration. There's something going on in the air. People sense it. And so they're scrambling to take as much as they can because they sense something is around the corner. So rather than break into stores and, and steal things, I want to encourage you all to remember this message, Emmanuel, God is with you. He is with us wherever we go. And our lowliest of lows and our highest of highs, He's there with us. He loves you. He loves me. And He's going to do everything He can to take care of you. And He'll always be there 
Now we will we will blunder from time to time. We'll drop the ball from time to time, and so we can confess that, and so we can recover from that. But please remember that the real reason for Christmas is that we've got it all. Think about it. We've got it all, literally. We've got protection from the highest of highs, more greater than any military uh, force out there. He's got angels, legions of angels. He can th he can charge them to go around you and keep you safe if he so desires. He can protect you from things that you can't even see in the angelic realm. He can protect you from being slammed by another car, by a truck head on. And you see all these accidents that, that freakishly happen. What about that car that went off into um, Woodbridge Lake? I heard about that recently. The, a lady just died and uh, ran her car into the bottom of, uh, was it Woodbridge Lake? It, it's frightening to know that these are just happening around the corner right f near you guys. That's where I had my... Um, you call it my reception for my wedding and there was a restaurant there and uh, a car ran off and went into the lake and went to the bottom and drowned to death so tell me accidents don't happen they do they happen all the time and I think they serve as a reminder for all of us that time is of the essence time is of the essence and we must either get right with God or get people right with God by sharing the gospel with them. So, let his love radiate outward, bringing hope, peace, and joy to all who need it. From our lives, people need this, ladies and gentlemen. A couple more verses here. I thought I was done, but I realized I have a few more. So, I want you to think about, they got a couple verses here. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Listen to this, Isaiah 7:14. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Again, God with us. That's in Isaiah 7.14. And several hundred years later, in Matthew 1.23, this is what would happen. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. So these verses highlight the prophecy from the Old Testament and Isaiah and its fulfillment in the New Testament with the birth of Christ, the birth of Jesus. They emphasize that Jesus as Emmanuel is the presence of God with us, bringing hope and salvation. Matthew sees the birth of Jesus as the fulfillment of the prophecy in, taken from Isaiah, emphasizing that Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament messianic expectations several hundred years prior. And in fact, if I recall properly, if, in, if my memory serves me correctly, in my seminary days, I think 300 prophecies were fulfilled on just the birth of Christ alone. And that's staggering when you really think it through. So that's Isaiah 7.14, Matthew 1.23. So the big deal here is Matthew 1.23 is a full... Uh, fulfills Isaiah 7.14. So what they said in Isaiah 7.14 eventually came to pass in Matthew 1.23, fulfilled prophecy. Okay, It's one of the main reasons we believe in the Bible. It's veracity. So the Word became flesh after this we're done. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So this verse from the Gospel of John emphasizes the incarnation of Jesus, indicating that the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among humanity. It emphasizes how Jesus fully embodies and reveals God's glory, God's grace, and His truth. All in 1.14, the Word became flesh. If you take John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and link that to 14, the Word became flesh, and dwelt or tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So, Matthew 8.20, this is really the last verse. Matthew 8.20, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So in this verse, 
Jesus assures his disciples and by extension all believers, also known as the principle of continuity, by extension us as believers, that he is with them always even until the end of the age. It emphasizes the enduring presence of God through Jesus providing you and me comfort and encouragement every season of life, good, bad, or indifferent. He's always there. He's just a chapter and a verse away in His Word. We just need to seek Him and we will find Him, the Scripture says. We go into the Word and we will find Him. So the, this, the significance and closing of Emmanuel lies in its biblical context, particularly in the prophecy of Isaiah 7.14, and its fulfillment in Matthew 1.23. Emmanuel, which means God with us, symbolizes the profound idea, think about this, of God's presence and closeness to humanity, to us. He came from down up here, down here, to be with us. I mean, that's what relationship is all about, right? To be with each other. He came from up here to be with us, down here. So these verses collectively affirm the profound meaning of Emmanuel depicting Jesus as the incarnation of God's presence among us, humanity. They remind us that God's love, guidance, and comfort are always available to us. Always, always, always. And to that we can find hope and strength knowing that Jesus is with us throughout our lives. So ladies and gentlemen, that concludes my message to you all. I hope that was a source of encouragement and a reminder that Emmanuel, God is with us. You might be going through some rough, turbulent times now, but that doesn't mean he's not there. He's there and he's just a Bible book away, a prayer away. But as you recall these things that we're, we, we looked at tonight, please know that just the name alone, Emmanuel, is a reminder that God is with us. Just in the name. Sometimes, if you've ever noticed that people, when they, when they have babies, they pick specific names because it has meaning, right? Certain meanings, and so they, they call their son, their daughter, this, because it has this meaning to it. God, in his brilliance, chose to use the word Emmanuel. He wanted the world, for many of generations, to know God is with us. So when we celebrate Christmas... God with us. When we would celebrate the resurrection, God with us. It all is encapsulated in God is with us. God is with us. So may you enjoy the rest of the time this evening together. And please remember this message. I will also have this on our YouTube channel if you're interested in it. But please remember God with us. God with you. Emmanuel. May God bless you all. And I hope to see you really soon. So you take care and hold the line, Church of Hope. And I will see you all soon in God's time. So Merry Christmas and Emmanuel. God bless you all. Bye-bye.